So we'll look at 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 through 5 together. And we are going to be looking at this message entitled, Following the Chief Shepherd. Um, And as I mentioned, we as his people called sheep, um, it's not a very flattering picture. Just as that sheep who uh, ran and fell into a ditch that the shepherd had to take out only to do it again, that is somewhat similar to our lives. We need a good shepherd. We need Jesus. Uh, We need one who is going to care for us uh, time and time again. And he is the chief shepherd. He is the one who cares for us. Now, for our scripture reading, we read Psalm 23. And I just want to read that Hebrew song again that recounts the goodness of the Lord. And let's just mention some of the tender ways that Jesus, the good shepherd, cares for us. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And we see the good shepherd's care. He watches over. He provides for his people. Uh, going along uh, the, the still waters and the green pastures he provides for us. It goes on to say, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so here the good shepherd actually cares for our spiritual well-being also. Our, our, our spiritual maturity and growth. And he's the one who keeps our souls. And then verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We like to think of the good shepherd leading us along the still waters and in the green pastures, but we also see that he also leads us through the dark valleys. And he's still a good shepherd, even in those moments, and he actually cares for us in the day of trouble. And he is the one who protects us and comforts us. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And here the good shepherd lavishes blessings upon his sheep. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. When? Forever. Forever and ever. And here the good shepherd, what has he done for us? He has promised to lead us safely home one day to an eternal home. And so in that psalm, we have this beautiful description. We have this comforting and this hope-filled description that Jesus is the good shepherd because we're all too often like the sheep that continually jumps in the ditch and needs rescuing. We are the sheep of his pasture. He is the one that we follow. He's the chief shepherd. He will always be the chief shepherd. But for today, we're not yet home, if you will. We're not yet there with him for eternity. And the day and age we live in, he has placed over his flock, over his people, over his sheep, shepherds, under shepherds, lowercase s shepherds, to guard and protect and to feed and to comfort his people. He still does this, but often he does it through these shepherds. And these shepherds, they're simply sheep themselves. But they're sheep who have the responsibility of oversight and care for God's flock, until he returns. And now we know these sheep. We know, or we know these shepherds. These shepherds are pastors. Pastors of local churches. So our English title past, pastor comes from the Latin word for shepherd. So basically, literally, pastor means shepherd. So Steve Carlson, we're rejoicing that God has raised him up to be the associate shepherd here at Central Baptist Church. You can call him Shepherd Steve, okay? And he might not want that. Steve or pastor may be fine there, but you can call him that. That's basically what pastor means, a shepherd. Shepherd. But it is a title that reminds us of the role. It reminds us of the task that God has given to the men who he's appointed to lead his local churches. They're not the chief shepherd. We're going to see Jesus in this passage. He's the chief shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the the great shepherd of his sheep. Both pastors are called shepherds. They're called out from among the sheep to lead the flock towards Jesus, the good shepherd. And so the pastors have God-given responsibility in the church, but so do the individual sheep. 
there's much instruction that we'll see in the passage before us, but we're going to be left with the ge- this general exhortation to the church. Church, follow Jesus. Church, follow Jesus. And so we're going to see the two roles. Now we're going to spend most of the time on the role of the pastor. That's the bulk of this um, section. And truthfully, over this last week, as I've been studying and preparing and then writing it, um, I got done and I thought, you know what, I just spent, you know, eight, nine, ten hours, I don't know how many, just preaching to myself this week, okay? It's been good. Um, But we're going to spend most of the time talking about the role of the pastor, but we'll look at the responsibility of the sheep as well. So we're first, we're going to see pastors, shepherd like Jesus, shepherd like Jesus. And then for the people, submit to the pastors. We'll see that in a few moments. But the first four verses, we see the pastor's role, and they're to shepherd like Jesus. This is how they lead towards Christ. This is how they follow Jesus, by shepherding like him. He says this, 1 Peter 5, verse 1, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So now let me just give you a little bit of background because we're jumping into the end of the book of 1 Peter. And so just a little background is helpful for us. Peter is writing to a predominantly Gentile people. These are people who lived under the Roman Empire. It was a day when persecution was increasing against the church, and so much of the people were starting to suffer for their faith. In fact, 1 Peter is a, is a letter all about suffering for the sake of the gospel in a hostile world. How do we live out the gospel in a world that is hostile to Jesus? That's the point of 1 Peter. And so the first four, verse, or four chapters up until this point has described to us our great salvation, especially chapter 1, if you read First Peter. It describes our great salvation. And then Peter gives practical instruction in the various realms of our life uh, of how we are to live out the gospel in a world that is hostile to Jesus. So it's been mostly outward-focused instruction. And now as he gets to chapter 5, he looks inward, and he looks inside the church. And he begins to instruct, and the first ones that he instructs inside the church, if you will, is those who are given the responsibility to lead, and that's the elders, the elders. Now, you may have even heard us at times here at Central use that title, elder. Most often we refer to uh, those in leadership position as pastors, uh, that God has given, but the biblical term here is elders, and we might even say that we have a multiplicity of elders here, or eldership here pastors. Scripture uses three titles that are used interchangeably for the role of the pastor, and that is elder. Uh, then there is bishop and overseer. That's one of uh, another title. And then you have shepherds, or as we say, pastor. And so each of these titles describe a unique function of the position, but all describe this position of pastor in the local church. And so Peter says, I am going to exhort the elders among you. And that idea of exhort has this idea of come alongside to encourage, to give instruction. And he says, you know what? I want to give some instruction to the pastors that are among you, the elders that are among you. Now, I want you to note this qualification. This book, 1 Peter, would have been read in the hearing of the church, in the hearing of the people within a local church. And so the following instruction that is going to be given is given to a defined group of men who were in a defined local church. The church members could identify who these men were. As he's writing, they could read this book and they say, all right, these are the elders that are among us. They were not the elders across town. They were not pastors in another church. But these were men that God had raised up for leadership in this particular local congregation. And Peter says this, he says, I'm in a position to encourage these elders because I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. Now, Peter, we understand, had the special position of an apostle given to him by Jesus. But Peter doesn't actually appeal to that. 
he appeals to his role as an elder, as a leader within the church. And it's from this position, it's from this experience that Peter is going to speak. And if you remember at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, what did Peter do? He denied Jesus, right? Denied him three times. He went out, wept bitterly. We don't hear much about Peter during the rest of the crucifixion account and then the resurrection account. He shows up again. And then when Jesus comes to restore Peter, what does Jesus do? He says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter says, yes, yes, yes. You know I love you. And what is the instruction that Jesus gives to Peter? He says, feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. The idea there is shepherd my sheep sheep. Uh, it's Jesus's people. Peter was given the position of a shepherd by commission from Jesus. And so he says, you know what? I'm a fellow elder. I want to encourage the other pastors in your local church. So Peter was also a witness, he mentions, to the sufferings of Jesus and a partaker of the glory to come. Peter had seen Jesus opposed by the people of his day. Peter had watched Jesus arrested and, and, and wrongly accused. He knew of Jesus' suffering and death, but he had also seen the risen Lord. And that's going to come to play when he mentions the great glory and the blessed reward that God's people have in the risen Savior. And so he says, I have been a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and I, have, I, I am a partaker, I'm a fellow heir, if you will, in the glory that is going to be revealed. And so he says, you can be encouraged by this, and let me give you some practical instruction. He said, elders, shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And so here's the first thing. He answers this question that might have been in some of the pastor's minds. Maybe not, but he he says this, or he answers this question, who does an elder, who does a pastor shepherd? It's not just anyone. It's not everyone They lead specific people. He said, elders, shepherd the flock of God that's among you. Verse 3, that's in your charge. So mentioned, there's this defined group. It's the believers who are among them. And that group we see here has been given to them as a charge. They didn't pick this group necessarily. They didn't choose this portion of the flock. It was God who placed this group of people under their charge, under the oversight of the elders. So Pastor Steve and I, we're not pastors of any believer we run into. We're not. We're not even uh, a pastor to every believer who listens to the messages or the teaching that we place online. We're not even the pastors of everyone who might walk into the door on a Sunday morning. We're pastors of a defined group of people, those whom God has apportioned out together under the local designation of Central Baptist Church. So let's define that a little bit more. Jesus promised what? To build his church, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus is the one who purchased his church in Acts 20, 28. He's the one who's making the church holy to present it to himself as a, a spotless bride in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. There is one church. We know that we talk about the universal church. This is the church of God, God's people, the bride of Christ. We could say there's one flock, Jesus' people, his sheep. However, they're not all in the same field. They're not all in the same physical location or the same physical group. He has chosen, Jesus has chosen to apportion out of his main flock, he has has subdivided into smaller physical flocks called the local church. And Jesus has placed over the local flocks specific shepherds to watch over, to care for that portion of the church. So even here in Bend, Oregon, I am thankful that there are multiple gospel preaching churches. Uh, There are multiple portions, if you will, of Jesus's flock or his church. And in those local churches, God has placed and raised up elders and pastors to shepherd those portions of the flock. Jesus is the one, as we see here, who is 
who apportions the flock in their local congregation. Some flocks are larger, some flocks are smaller, but that's his determination, that's his design. So the encouragement to the pastors is this. You do not choose who or how many are placed in your care. That's an encouragement. That's God's doing. The elder's responsibility is simply to shepherd the flock of God that's among you. The ones God has placed together and put under your charge. That he's apportioned to you. And this is also a reminder that elders are still sheep. Pastors are still sheep. They've given, been given a responsibility to lead as under shepherds, as overseers. But as sheep, pastors can be tempted like all of us. They can spend too much time trying to pastor flocks that are not their own. We might see this at times when a pastor spends more time on their internet presence than actually caring for the people that are among them. Pastors can be tempted to spend time trying to woo sheep from other flocks into their into their church, or they might be tempted to covet what uh, the what flocks look like in other locations. And these temptations seek to lure an elder away from their responsibility to care for those that God gave them to care for. But here's the encouragement: He says, "Shepherd, pastor, care for those God has given you to care for. Be faithful with them." God is the one who has apportioned them. God is the one who has placed them under your charge, under your care. So we see there's a defined role. Specific men that God has placed over his church as elders. And and today we get the, the wonderful privilege of recognizing Steve as one of the elders, one of the pastors that God has placed over his church here at Central Baptist Church. Steve is a good gift from God to his people. Ephesians 4, 11 tells us that Jesus is the one who gives to the church pastors and teachers. So Steve is a gift from God to this church. But this is also true for each member that Jesus gives to a local church. Let's continue to look at the language here that is used throughout this passage. So we've already seen in verse 1, he says, elders who are among you. Right? You, collective there. Uh, And then verse 2, shepherd the flock that's among you again. Verse 3, those in your care. Verse 3 again, examples to the flock. He's talking about defined people group. Verse 5, he talks about uh, some of those within that flock. Younger, subject to the elders. There's defined roles. Verse 5, all of you. He's talking about the whole again uh, there in that locale. Uh, Then verse 5 again, humility toward one another. We see this language time and again talking about this togetherness, this oneness, this identity. The local church is defined by a specific group an identifiable group of believers. These are individuals that are are to be doing the work of the ministry. We see that in Ephesians 4, verse 12. They're individual members who are to be working together to build up the whole in Ephesians 4, 16. And the individual members then are gifts from God as well. God is the one that has placed this unique group of believers together. He's the one who who defines the the local churches. And he brings individuals together for a specific purpose and reason. And that's for the work of the ministry, for building up the body through the gospel. Now, practically, prudently, historically, that defining that God has done has been uh, practically worked out within local churches through uh, some sort of form of church membership. Uh, Church membership is simply a public declaration of one's faith. It's a public commitment uh, to the people that God has placed you among, as well as submission to the leadership that God has placed over you. Uh, It is a public commitment to the care of God's people and church and the furtherance of the gospel. So membership just defines that group that God has already defined. It recognizes the group that God has already placed together. So in one sense, one, a person is not fully connected to the church or to the flock without making that commitment. And that's why I say anyone that just because someone's visiting doesn't mean now all of a sudden I am their pastor. Um, just because someone hears one of my messages doesn't make me their pastor. And just because someone walks in the door doesn't necessarily mean that they're committed to 
this church or even a part of this church. Um, otherwise, there are, and, and so we see that membership is often how we practically have defined what God has already defined. And that's why the writer of Hebrews exhorts the believers this way in Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders, so those who you have placed yourself under, and those who recognize you as under their charge from the Lord. There was a defined group again. Submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So here he says, the elders, the pastors, they actually give an account before the chief shepherd on how they cared for the sheep that were placed in their care. And only for the sheep that were placed in their care. So Steve and I, we're not going to give an account for the flock of another congregation. Uh, we're not going to necessarily give an account for the believers uh, who are not connected to Central. There are other believers in Central Oregon, but we, they're not under our charge. Nor will we give an account, at least to the same degree, for, for those who um, have not willingly committed or submitted to this church. We have a higher degree of responsibility to those who are in that defined flock, this local church. And that's true for the membership as well. You have a greater responsibility to those who have willingly submitted to your care and who have committed to caring for you as well. And so we see this defined group in elders, pastors. He's saying here, shepherd the flock that's among you. Don't worry about necessarily those who are outside of that group. You know, if God has you to shepherd them, he'll bring them in. But shepherd the flock. Don't miss the flock that's among you in your church. But then he gives instruction. Well, how do the pastors, elder, uh, pastors and elders, how do they shepherd well? We know who they have to shepherd. How do they shepherd well? And we're given a list of positives and negatives. So let's look at the negatives first. He says, don't do so under compulsion. And don't do so for shameful gain. Don't do so domineering. So not under compulsion. This is the idea of, of, of having the feeling of being forced or maybe even a sense of dread uh, or being guilted into doing a duty. And so we know what this kind of obedience looks like, what under compulsion looks and feels like. Uh, maybe it's the child who whines about the task but will do it anyway because he's going to want to avoid the negative consequences or, uh, or doesn't want to give up the... the the reward. Or maybe this is the adult who begrudgingly does their duties simply to avoid getting fired and, and hopes that one day they'll have a better future. We all kind of know what it feels like to do a task begrudgingly or under compulsion. But here he says, pastors, don't lead this way. Don't shepherd this way. Do not begrudge your duty. It's a privilege. It's a responsibility. But it's a great privilege that God has given you. He says, don't do so for shameful gain. Now, immediately that might come to mind is don't do so just for money. Just to get rich. But there's even more in that idea than just money. Shameful gain would include maybe a desire for notoriety. Maybe a desire for the respected position. Maybe it is more of the idea of this is a stepping stone ministry so that one day I'll have a, a greater ministry. Or more, uh, or more power. So part of that idea of shepherding the flock that's among you is this idea of being present in time. The elders are to pastor the flock in the present, not using the people for hopes of personal gain in the future. Live in the moment, if you will. Pastor in the moment. Lead in the moment. Not for selfish gain. He also says, not domineering. We might say, not lording it over the flock. Now, this is the abuse of the authority that God has given to the position. Now, there is authority that has been given to the position of pastor, but when that authority is overstepped, when it's used for personal gain or to oppress God's people, that would be domineering. And so he says, indeed, elders, they must preach the word of God boldly. Elders must confront sinners in their sin. Elders may even have to lead the local church to discipline a wayward member. But these are not domineering. These are all part of the responsibility of shepherding and caring for the church. That's appropriate authority. But when a pastor uses their influence to benefit themselves, 
or, or when a pastor demands that the people never question their leader, leader, leadership or, or obey all their personal and practical advice, that would be domineering. So he says here, not on compulsion, not for shameful gain, not domineering, but then let's look at some of the positives. He says this, here's how you shepherd. He said, elders do this, shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight. Oversight. The idea of oversight is to, to look over, a watchfulness over the church. It's an awareness of the church and the, the people in the flock. Uh, it's, it's being able to, to watch uh, so that they can properly instruct and lead and care for and feed and protect the people. So it does take a watchfulness. It takes a diligence. As Hebrews thirteen seventeen, the pastors give an account because they're watching over your souls your souls. Now, thankfully, God has given the pastors tangible ways to do this. And the first tangible way is the Word of God. The Word of God. He's given them the responsibility to teach faithfully the Word of God. It's through the Word of God, by the work of the Holy Spirit, that conviction comes, that that actually transformation in a heart happens. So one of the greatest ways a pastor can demonstrate his love for the people is to give himself to the diligent study and the faithful proclamation of the word of God. Very practically speaking, if, if Steve or I get up and we are well read and, and well prepared and well studied and we proclaim accurately the word of God, that is a sign of our love for you. That we are willing to take the time to faithfully handle the word of God for you and for your souls pastor also uses the word of God for exhortation. And this is maybe the the personal use of the word of God in a life. This is where discipleship happens. This is where equipping the saints for the ministry maybe takes on a little bit more practical form. This is speaking the truth in love. This is calling a sinner to repentance. It's teaching and exhorting. Uh, A pastor does this not by his own authority, but by taking the authority of the word of God and bringing it to bear upon an individual's soul. So pastor uses it for exhortation. The pastor also uses the word of God to guard and protect the people from false teachers, from false, false doctrine. There's a purity that needs to be maintained within the local church. Paul encouraged the elders of the church of Ephesus in this way in Acts 20, 28 through 29. He said to them, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, that oversight again, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. This is a precious group of people. And he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. He said, there's going to be attacks against the flock from false teachers. And so the pastors are there to protect, and we do so by proclaiming the truth by confronting those in in the church that might be speaking wrong doctrine, that those who might be seeking to divide the flock as well. We also guard by examining one's confession of faith before their baptism or before bringing them into church membership. That's how the pastors guard examining the people by the word of God. So the ministry of the word is a, is, is a caring watchfulness, leading the people on the right path to Jesus through teaching his word. It's seeing the dangers that might be upcoming, addressing those pitfalls, lovingly caring for and encouraging and comforting those who are hurting, pursuing those who are wandering from the flock. And a lot of that happens without your knowledge. In fact, if it all goes well, you probably won't know much of that's happening. The word of God is used by the elders in many ways to watch over and shepherd the flock. But there's another tangible way the elders have been uh, given, uh, or another tangible way the elders shepherd or care for the flock. And that's by the example of their own life. He says in verse 3 that they are to be an example to the flock. So the elders' lives, their faith, must be lived out as godly examples for other people to pattern their faith after. This is a great responsibility. We read this in Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, and do this. Consider the outcome of of their way of life and imitate their faith. 
Remember, pastors are just sheep. They've been called out to have this position of oversight. But as sheep, they are to lead by example, to, to, to show how it looks to follow Jesus. Maybe one of the greatest evaluating questions that a pastor could ponder is this. Would this church be healthy and fulfilling God's design if all the members of the church lived out the faith as you do, as I do? A pastor should be able to say yes to that because a pastor must be able to say, follow me as I follow Jesus. This is the role of an elder to point people not to themselves, but pass themselves to the chief shepherd, to Jesus. So the way we live out our faith, it must be clear. It must be good to follow. And here's how the elders are to do this as well. Here's the hard attitude. He says, do all of this willingly and eagerly. Now together, those two words, they describe a desire. They describe a joy in service, a freedom. Once again, not under that compulsion, but a freedom uh, from a full heart. It describes an intentional and deliberate shepherding, not half-hearted, but, but with, with full joy and desire. A willingness, an eagerness that's not wrapped up in, in popularity, that's not wrapped up in, in how many likes on, on Facebook, and not how big the church is, or not even how well the ministry is going. It's a joy that comes from faithfully serving Jesus in the role and in the place that he has given. There's this contentment in ministry. So to pastor, to shepherd people, to Jesus, and to do so for him, it's a great responsibility, but it's a wonderful privilege, and it's one to be pursued with joy, he says to the pastors. And he gives us encouragement in verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So here, Jesus is, calling, is called the chief shepherd again. The good shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep, right? And one day, Jesus is going to return, and he is going to set up his kingdom. And pastoring, we see, is only a temporary role. It's only for a certain time. Because one day the chief shepherd is going to arrive himself, himself and elders, and shepherds, pastors, they're not going to be needed anymore. And on that day, that day when he returns and establishes his earthly kingdom that then will give way to his eternal kingdom, on that day, he says, the faithful elder, the faithful pastor, they're going to receive the unfading crown of glory. Pastors aren't to pastor for the benefits now, he says. That's, that's a poor Sinful motivation. They're to do so because it is the position that the chief shepherd placed them in. But he says, you know what? It's going to be worth it. You're going to share in the unfading crown of glory. Now he's mentioning this in the context of pastors, but it isn't a reward that's just for pastors. It's for all of God's people. Here he is encouraging the pastors, but this unfading crown of glory is the glory of Jesus in his kingdom that we're going to share in, that we're going to enjoy, that as people are going to enjoy for eternity. In fact, a few verses later, if you look down to verse 10, Peter encourages all the saints in the church this way. He says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you, what? To his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. There's this coming day when we all, when God's people share in the glory of Jesus for eternity. That's the motivating factor for serving him well now. For pastors, we'll see here in a moment for the people as well. So elders, shepherd like Jesus, he says. Do so as the chief shepherd would. Do so by faithfully proclaiming his word. Do so by caring and guarding God's people with oversight. Do so by setting an example of faith for others to follow. Do so willingly and do so with joy. But here then we see just briefly the sheep of the, the responsibilities of the sheep of the flock. And we see people submit to the pastors, verse 5. So here's the way that God's people within a church can follow Jesus. Likewise, he says, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. 
clothes yourself, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now here, the younger can specifically be younger men that he's calling out. It could describe those who are, who are younger in maturity, possibly as well. Maybe even those who are younger in ministry. And kind of given the flow of the passage, the natural understanding would probably be instructing, he's instructing specifically uh, younger men. Potentially, they may have been either causing some problems or truthfully, younger men sometimes can be the more rebellious <laughs> it might be. But he's using them simply as an example for others as well. This wasn't just for the younger men. This was for the people of the church. Later, he's going to talk about humility for all. So the flock, the people of the church, are to submit, he says, to the leadership that God has placed over the church. Be subject to the elders. Be subject to the pastors, he said. This is good. This is pleasing to God. So just as the pastors are to serve willingly, back up in verse 2, as God would have you, he says, this is God's will. So the members of the flock are to submit to the elders for the same reason, because it's the will of God. So we have to ask the question, what does he mean by submitting to the pastors then? And the answer is really wrapped up to the degree that the elders have authority or their position. And the pastor's authority is to lead the church through the word of God and by the example of their faith. So the way that you submit to the elders is by listening to the teaching of the elders with a willingness to obey the word of God. That's the first way. Now, this implies that you're availing yourself to the teaching of the elders because you can't submit to the word of God that they are proclaiming if you're not hearing the word of God that they're proclaiming. And it also does imply, again, that you've made a commitment to submitting to a specific pastor and elder and church. Because the truth is, you're not required to submit to all pastors. He says the pastors here that are among you, right? You don't have to submit to all the pastors in Bend nor do you have to submit to all the YouTube pastors that you might listen to. They're not your pastors. They may be helpful in your spiritual walk, and I'm thankful for all the, the, the resources we have today, but the truth is they're not watching over your soul. They're not going to give an account for your soul. So he says here to submit to the elders is to make a public commitment to a local church and to its pastors, a specific commitment to a specific group. You're basically saying, this is my flock. The, this, these are my elders. These are who I'm accountable to God for, or before God and his word. So submitting to their shepherding means an identifiable people in church, but to humbly listen, obey the word of God that they share with you from the pulpit, from the Bible lessons, maybe even to the private counsel and exhortation. Because when you make that commitment, not only are you getting and receiving the, the public teaching, if you will, but the truth is you are also submitting to their leadership so that they have the right, if you will, the authority from God to speak truth in your life if they see you going in error. The second way that can, you can submit to the elders is by following their example, the example of their way of life or their faith. So they're living it out for you to follow. They're following Jesus so that you can watch them and then follow Jesus as well. So if your pastors live out a, a great delight for God, you follow by delighting in God. If they live out faithfulness to God's word, you live faithful to the word of God. If they live out an example of evangelizing their neighborhood, you evangelize your neighborhood. If they live out caring for the downtrodden and burdened, you live out that compassion and mercy. If they live out discipling God's people towards Jesus, you do the same. That's the call in the passage for the elders to live by example not just so that others can look and say, that's a great example, but that others would follow. And there's the responsibility of submission that we see here by God's people to the pastors. Practically, this can also mean following their direction for the church. Of course, we have to say that it, as long as that fits within the biblical principles that we find in Scripture. But here we see this heart of submission. It's not a heart of contention, it's a heart of humility. And that's why he follows this up by saying this, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so he says, all of you, this would include the pastors, pastors be humble. 
And, and a humble pastor is going to place the sheep before themselves. Uh, he's going to willingly spend and be spent for their sake. And then the humble people are going to submit to the leadership that God has placed over them, and they will serve the flock in the same practical ways they see their pastor serving the flock. Now this humble submission only comes, firstly comes, when one humbly submits to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that, you're still living in your pride. If Jesus hasn't saved you by his grace through that gift of faith, then you're still in your sin and judgment is yours in the end. But Jesus did die on the cross for you. Jesus did rise again from the dead so that you could call upon the name of the Lord and be saved from the wrath to come. That's humbling yourself before the Lord. And that heart of humility then is seen in your walk with him within the life of the church. Willing to submit to his people, willing to submit to the leaders over you that he's placed over you. He, he said, this is good. It, it, it's, the, it's, a, it's good because this is God's design to care for your soul. God did not design us to walk alone. God did not design us to be alone. That's why he brought us together as sheep into a flock. The truth is we can't live out our Christian faith alone. We can't even pursue Jesus well alone. We see that all throughout scripture. That's why he has given us local churches. That's why he's even placed pastors for the care of your soul. Do you care for your soul enough to be committed to a local church and to the pastors? That's what he's saying. And so this also then leads out to a commitment to others' souls as well. Because if you're humbly submitting yourself, you're going to place others as better than yourselves, um, Philippians chapter 2, and you're going to care for them. It's a responsibility that not only the pastors have, but each individual member of a church has, is to care for the well-being and the spiritual well-being of the other people in the church. So here we have another helpful evaluating question. Let me ask you this. If all the members of this church serve Jesus and his people as you do, would this church be a healthy church? Would it be a stronger church? Or would it actually be a weaker church? It's a question we all can ponder and think about. I pray that it would be that this church would be even built up more in its walk with the Lord as we encourage one another towards Jesus. And that's his point here. This is what needs to happen. This is what needs to happen in a world that is hostile to Jesus, is that a church, that it would follow Jesus, that it would follow Jesus well. Now today we're rejoicing that the Lord raised up Steve Carlson to be pastor here at Central. And, and together, he and I, we're, 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 we're striving to make this commitment to follow Jesus well, to shepherd through the teaching of his word, to live our lives out examples for you to follow in faith. And today the church then is called to follow Jesus by submitting to the pastoral leadership and then by humbly serving one another. And in this way, a church follows Jesus, the chief shepherd. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words that you have for us from your word in 1 Peter 5. Lord, I thank you for your wonderful design for the church. We need you. And we need your aid in this, Lord. Father, the pastors here at Central, we need you. We cannot lead well without your aid and without the strength even and the encouragement of the church. And then, Lord, each individual needs you as well and needs one another that we would walk properly before you. Father, may our heart be one of, of humility, may it be one of service, may it be one of submission, to you and to one another. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.